Good morning again. Uh, this morning we are uh, continuing in this little series that we've been in for a few weeks now that we're calling uh, Cloud of Witnesses. It comes from a phrase in the Newer Testament book of Hebrews where the writer of Hebrews says, Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and run the race of perseverance or the life of faith of God, that God has laid out for us. This idea that there are people, men and women, who have gone before us about what it looks like, shown us what it looks like to live a life of faith, a good and pleasing life in alignment with God's kingdom, that there are people who have walked this road of faith before us. And because we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, we can persevere a life of faith, that we can continue to live a life well-lived in the kingdom of God right now as following in the footsteps of these men and women of faith that have persevered and shown us what it might look like. We began this series a couple weeks ago by looking at a guy named Barnabas and how the, one of the ingredients to a life well lived is a life of encouraging others to, to help them live up to their greatest potential. That part of what it looks like for us to live a life well lived in good obedience to the faithful ways of Jesus is to encourage, to uplift other people so that they might find their highest potential in God's kingdom as well. The last week we looked at this Ethiopian eunuch, a high official in Ethiopia, and what it looks like to live a life connected with brothers and sisters who are also hungry for the things of God. That part of what it looks like to live a life well lived in the kingdom is to be surrounded with people who are also hungry for the things of God and God's kingdom as well. So both of these ingredients along the way. And this morning we're going to look at another ingredient to what it looks like to live a life well. A life well lived in the kingdom of God, pursuing the ways of God. Not only does it mean that we live to encourage others to find their greatest potential in the kingdom. Not only does it mean that we surround ourselves with brothers and sisters who are hungry for the kingdom of God. But this morning we're going to look at an unnamed person. In the scripture, someone we don't know who they are. We don't know a lot about them, actually, just a very few short verses, but whose story has been shared for generation and generation, whose story has been set apart for us in the scriptures, and what it looks like for us to live a good and faithful life. One more ingredient to a life well lived. Her story is found in Luke chapter 21. So if you have a Bible with you, I'd invite you to open up, or if you have an app on your phone or somewhere. Luke chapter 21. There's only four verses here. It's a very short story, but Luke chapter 21, verses 1 to 4, and this is the story as it reads this way. Jesus looked up. He saw the rich putting in their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she gave out of her poverty and put in all she had to live on. The subject of money is one of those taboo subjects that we don't really like to talk about. We'd rather kind of brush past some of these aspects of what it looks like to live well as it relates to our finances, to our money. In particular, there's a stigma at the, about the church, that the church is always talking about money. And, and many of us throughout the years, if we've been around church, have heard messages full of guilt and shame and makes us squirm in our chairs just a little bit whenever the subject of money comes up. And I hope you know me well, or you're getting to know me well, and I've got no desire or no intention to be a guilt-driven, shame-based pastor, nor do I have any desire to make people unnecessarily uneasy. But we do need to pay attention to these things. I like actually what Philip Yancey wrote once in a little booklet on money. He writes this. He says, mostly I wish I did not have to think about money at all. But I must somehow come to terms with the Bible's very strong statements about money. Because the Bible does 
And Jesus does have a lot to say about how to live well, and he also has to say about how we handle our finances and our money. So we're going to wade into this kind of taboo subject along the way, always seeking wisdom from Jesus about how to live well. How to live well. So before we jump too far into what Jesus and this poor widow may teach us about life in his kingdom, let me pray for us, seeking his wisdom. Father, Son, and Spirit, we ask that you would be our teacher today. That we humbly surrender to your teaching, your truth, your wisdom about how to live well in this life. And in particular, in the difficult subject this morning of our money, I pray that you would bring us grace, wisdom, and humility. Along the way, may we experience the life you have called us to. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So this morning, through this poor widow, unnamed woman in the scriptures, through her experience, I hope us to understand the beauty of a life of giving. The beauty of a life of giving. And invite all of us to consider what it might look like to follow the teachings of Jesus to a life well lived, in particular as it relates to a life of giving. In this short little passage, four verses, we see another ingredient to this life well lived. Not just to be an encouraging person, not just surrounding ourselves with brothers and sisters who are hungry for the life of, life of God, but a life of joyfully participating through giving the work of God. Joyfully participating in the work of God through our act of giving. Jesus tells his disciples in this short little passage, he says, truly I tell you, which ought to perk up our ears a little bit. Whenever Jesus says, truly, listen up, I'm going to tell you something important. We ought to pay closer attention here. Lean in to what Jesus is going to say. And he says, truly I tell you, this poor widow gave more than all of the others. Gave more. And he upends our understanding of what more might be. Because for us, we hear the word more and we automatically think more quantity, like greater number, right? More means greater quantity. But the widow didn't give more quantity than all the others. Far be it, she didn't give anywhere near the kind of quantity that the others or the rich were giving. It wasn't that she gave more in quantity. What she gave was more or better because of how she gave. It wasn't the quantity, it was how she gave. In fact, if you look at the other translations of this small little, uh, ver- this small little story, it becomes very clear, abundantly clear, that the rich gave out of their excess what they would never miss. And while in quantity they may have given more, in quantity they gave out of what they would never miss. And she gave everything. And that is what is commended to her because she gave everything, held nothing back for the devotion and honor of God. She gave everything. And while they gave more in quantity, they just gave whatever they could afford out of their excess. They would never miss this at all. Her giving was an expression of a whole life that was surrendered to the will and the honor of God. Their giving was a giving out of what was left over. Therefore, she gave more because she gave her whole life in devotion and honor to God. Her offering in that little temple time there was an expression exactly of what Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter 6 where he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be given to you. Or what Romans 12, we read in, our, in, our more, in the call to worship this morning, that we ought to give God our whole bodies, offer God our, our bodies as a living sacrifice. That we give everything to honor and to devote ourselves to God. So for this unnamed poor widow, her giving was, a, it was an expression of deep devotion to God. That's why she gave more. That's why she gave more. It wasn't because she gave more quantity. It's because she gave more of her heart. 
She gave her, as expressed in her giving, but she gave her. Now, there's a biblical teaching to give a tithe. Tithe meaning tenth, right? Ten percent from the Older Testament. And it was God's way of initiating to sustain the work of the fellowship, to sustain the temple, and to sustain the worship of God's people. And often when we talk about giving, when we talk about a life of giving to God's work, we begin here. We begin with a tithe to set aside 10% of our earnings, of our resources to the work of God in this world. And this is good. And this might very well have been what the rich were doing in the passage, giving their 10%, giving what was required of the temple. But what this reminds us is that giving, a life of giving is not just about giving the bare minimum or just giving what's required. It's not just about the amount what is given, but it's the heart with which it is given. It's the heart with which it's given. So this morning as we look at a life, a beautiful life, well lived through the act of giving, the act of giving is learning to live a life with open hands. It's learning to live with open hands. This is what the poor widow that we don't know anything about models for us. She models a life with open hands, holding her whole life for the devotion and honor of God. She stands for us an example from all this time as a life well lived, a life well lived because she lived her whole life with open hand. Not only her life, but even her money. She freely gave, not out of obligation or guilt or shame, but freely gave gave. And giving is something that we've been hardwired to do. And whenever we step in line with how we've been created and made, it leads to a life more abundantly full and freeing and good and beautiful. Whenever we step in line with how God has made us, it leads to the fullness of life. And the opposite is true, actually. For whenever we live with clenched fists, clinging to our stuff or our material stuff, our money, then we're not living in line with the way in which we've been made. And it will always lead to brokenness, anxiety, and guilt. And we won't live well. We won't live well. So this morning I want to look at three reasons, right, that living with open hands, not clenched fists, but open hands with our life and with our giving, three reasons that that kind of will lead us to a life that is good and beautiful and well-lived in the kingdom. And the first reason to consider is because giving is in line with the character of God. Giving is in line with the character of God. A life well-lived is always consistent with the character of God. We live our best, in other words, when we are in sync with the heart of God. When we are out of sync with the heart of God, out of sync with the character of God, then we will cease to live our very best. And what we see in the character of God, in the very heart of God, is regularly and extravagantly giving. The most famous verse in the entire scripture is John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave. Gave his one and only son. And what does the son do? Jesus says in Mark 10, the Son of Man doesn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So when we learn to live with open hands, in particular learning to give of our time, of our resources, of our money, in particular how to partner with God in his good work, helping others to know the love and grace that is in Jesus, then we are participating in sync with the very character of God. So learning to live with open hands leads to a life well lived because it leads us to be in sync with the very character of God himself. But there's a second reason that we need to consider living with open hands, and that is that giving guards us from the love of money. Learning to give guards us from the love of money. Because money can become a trap for us that confuses our identity and our value as based on our net worth, on what we have accomplished and what we can accumulate. And so the Apostle Paul is really insightful to his young friend Timothy, and he writes to him in 1 Timothy chapter 6. He says this, The love of money is a root 
of all kinds of evil. And some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith, pierced themselves with many griefs. So a life of giving, a life with open hands with regards to my resources, guards my heart from being tantalized and seeing my identity in my stuff, in my net worth, in my accumulation of things, right? For a life well lived is never measured by what I obtain, but in the kind of person I become. A life well lived is not measured by what I obtain, but the kind of person I become. That's not to say that we all take a vow of poverty, though for some I'm sure it might mean that. It means that when I regularly give to the work of God, it is a way for me to set my priorities on heaven, on heavenly things, on kingdom things. And when my priorities are set, then I avoid the trap of materialism, of clinging to my identity in my stuff and my bank account. Now, whenever we talk about things like this, whenever I have talked on things like this, questions begin to emerge. People want to be faithful to the call of God in this kind of area, and they begin to ask questions like, is it ever okay for a Christian to have nice things? Is it ever okay for a Christian to have a nice car or, or go on a nice vacation or have a nice big house? I mean, how much is too much, right? How, all those kinds of questions. So over the years, I've had to respond to many of these questions, and you might be thinking some of these as well. So admittedly, let me give you my response to these kinds of questions. Now, this is my response. This is me, so take it for whatever it's worth, right? This is my response. Whenever someone asks me, is it okay for someone, Christian, to to do these things, have these things, go on these vacations or whatever, I always respond with three questions. Number one, have I given first priority to faithfully giving to the work of God? the local church? Have I already given faithfully of a top priority to the work of God in the local church? Am I setting aside 10% or more of my resources to the work of God? Am I being faithful regularly in my giving? Secondly, am I living within my means? Am I avoiding consumer debt at all costs? Purchasing things I cannot afford. Can I just kind of live under my means and within my means here? And then third question, will this purchase or this vacation or this home still allow me to be faithful to my faithful giving to the work of God? Am I being faithful? Am I living under my means? And will this purchase or vacation still allow me to be faithful to the call of God of giving? And if the answer to those questions is yes, I am being faithful to God, and yes, I am living under my means, and yes, this purchase will still allow me to be faithful and to be generous and live with open hands, then make the purchase. Go on the vacation. Buy the car. Buy the house. By all means, it's okay to live this way. But if the answer to one or more of those questions is no, well, then perhaps holding off on that purchase or that vacation is necessary until I can settle my priorities on the kingdom. I hope that helps you. Three questions. Am I being faithful? Am I living under my means? And will this purchase still allow me to be faithful? I hope that leads me to the third thing to consider with regards to living with open hands and how that leads to a life well lived. It's what I've been alluding to this entire morning, right? Giving is about the heart. Giving is about the heart. It's about the motivation. It's about what's driving us. So yes, there's a principle of the tithe. And I don't see Jesus getting away from that. But it's if we're motivated to just simply do the minimum, then we're not free to live a life well lived. We're not free from the trappings of the love of money. And we will always fall short of a life well lived. If I'm just doing the bare minimum to get by. What this unnamed poor widow teaches us, why she's commended for a life well lived of faith, more so than the giving of the rich of those that are around her. Why? It's not because she gave more in quantity, but it's the way in which she gave. It's the way in which she gave. Which leads me to ask at least, what were the motivations of the rich? 
What were the motivations of other people that were given that does not lead to a life well lived in the life of God's kingdom? And there's a couple at least options along the way. And as I consider some of these options, I want to invite us to think about these too. What might motivate us to be giving in a way that's maybe outside of where the, where the best or what God may have for us? What are our motivations for giving? First motivation that someone might give is the, or is the giving out of obligation because I have to, right? It was the, what the law said. I have to give. I mean, I got Someone's got to pay for the lights anyway, so we got to make sure we pay for these things. Just kind of keep things going. I'm just going to give because it's obligated. And while giving out of obligation might meet the technical requirements, there's no beauty in that. There's no goodness in that. There's no life well lived in that. It's just to check a box on a list to say, yeah, I did that, and move on from it. And we miss the whole point of Jesus' invitation to a life in his kingdom. If we're just giving out of obligation, it might meet the technical requirements, but it misses Jesus' invitation to a life well lived in his kingdom right now. The second motivation that's possible for us or for the rich in this case was that they were giving out of some kind of transaction. If I do this for God, then he will bless me. If I give more, he'll bless me more. If I give to the church, they'll let me do things at the church. If I, do, if I bless over here, then they'll give back to me. And whenever we are giving out of some kind of transaction in order to get something in return, there's an inherent problem in that. Because if we're giving out of a transaction to get more from God or to get more from the church or to get more from other people, then we are in control. And we're using our giving as a means to stiff arm God to do what we want him to do. And that is always dangerous. Always dangerous. To learn to try to control God for our purposes. That's a dangerous endeavor. But what this poor widow, what she models, is giving freely. Sure doesn't seem like it's out of obligation for her. Certainly not out of transaction, like she's going to get something in return. She gives with a heart of gratitude, with a heart of worship, freely gives everything. And she's commended, not because she gave quantity more, but because of the heart with which she gave. And it demonstrates a heart of devotion and honoring God above everything. Which again, the Apostle Paul is very wise and helpful in, the, in this area for us. He writes to the church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, says this, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. It's not out of obligation because you have to to check some religious box, not out of some transaction so that God has to help you in some other way or the church has to do things for you, but because of a freely devotion to God, I want to give to be in line and in sync with the heart of God. I'm learning to increasingly live my life with open hands in regards to my life, resources, finances, and all of it. We're invited to this interactive life with God. It is a beautiful invitation to a relationship where He is our highest priority. And whenever we live out of motivation of obligation or transaction, then we miss the invitation and we will not live a life well lived. We'll miss. The life with God is a life of abundance and goodness when we Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness when we offer our bodies as living sacrifices that leads to a life well lived. And God doesn't need our money, right? What he's inviting us to, not, be, not in order to pay off all of his bills, he's inviting us to a life of meaning and purpose and it will never be found when we're tight-fisted, holding on to our stuff or legalistic living will only be found when we find our truest life in His grace and we give our life in full devotion to Him. So this unnamed poor widow, she teaches that giving is not just about money. It's about my whole life. 
It's about opening my whole entire life, including how I perceive money and how I handle money to prioritize the worship of God, to freely give to the work of God in this world, and to trust Him to meet all the needs of the people around me and myself included, to learn to live my life practically seeking first the kingdom of God, the priorities in heaven above the things on earth that my heart and my mind may be filled with godly things. Now, I don't want to lead us down any kind of legalistic approach towards our giving and towards our, our time with our money, where we're constantly worried, did I give enough? Is, did I check off enough boxes and all that? That's just a heavy burden of obligation and legalism that doesn't do anybody any good, certainly doesn't li- lead to a life well lived in God's kingdom. But I do want to invite us, all of us, gently invite us deeper to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. To set our priorities to honor Him above everything else. And how does that reflect in our priorities of our spending and how we spend our resources? Jesus makes it very clear that the path towards a life well lived is through unclenched fists, open hands, to find ways without compulsion or guilt or shame or obligation to freely give of my finances and my resources to the work of God. So the invitation, the invitation is to come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Let him have your whole life. Open your heart and your life to him, your resources, to how he might use you and your things and your things that you are a part of to bless those around you. Start where you are with regards to giving. Start where you are. But as you give, courageously evaluate your giving. And to see, see it as my giving reflect a heart that desires to honor God with everything, with everything, above everything else. Does my giving reflect a heart of devotion like this unnamed poor widow whose faith is commended because she gave more than all the rest? See, a life well lived will never be measured by how much you obtain or accumulate, but in the kind of person you become. And this unnamed poor widow is commended for becoming the kind of person who lived well, who graciously extravagantly gave freely and devoted herself to the worship of God. So I pray that for you and for me as well, that we would grow in these ways and find the life that God has called us to abundantly beautiful, grace-given, and full. Let me pray for you. Jesus, recognize that this subject can bring up all sorts of feelings and anxieties along the way. I pray for grace to lead us to a heart and a life of radical generosity, a heart devoted to you that is reflected in our priorities, our spending, our time, and the use of our resources. Give us wisdom, give us faith, and give us strength along the way. It's in your name we pray. Amen.